we are coming back for the last time to the 13th chapter of Matthew. Now the part that's missing in the middle, verses 31 through 35, we read last week. Because this is one of those sayings of Matthew that's pretty hard to listen to because it talks about judgment. Nobody likes to hear about judgment, even in church, right? But this is Jesus speaking again with his disciples in the crowd that is gathered around. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds, would, the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will let, tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and the disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evil doers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There are certain things that seem to elude me. One is the great blue heron. If I ever see a great blue heron, I do not have a camera with me. If I have a camera with me and I see a great blue heron, it's going to fly away. So I told this to a friend of mine who I take pictures with often, and he said, I'll take you where there's always going to be blue heron, the Tapsco River. And we walked and we walked and we walked, and sure enough, as we were coming through the trees, out there in the river was this beautiful blue heron, and next to him was his friend. They were standing in the sun. It was just a perfect photograph opportunity. I took my lens out. I was creeping up to take a picture. Just then a woman yelled to her husband, make him fly, honey, make him fly. And the man ran out into the water so she could get them on her cell phone. And she said, oh, missed it. Then that day I went home with my camera in the back of my car and standing at my little road, I lived on a tiny little road in the middle of an apple orchard and a cow farm, stood a blue heron. I rolled the window down. He walked up like, what can I do for you? I said to him, would you mind standing still until I can get my camera out of the back and take your picture? And he sort of gave me the bird finger and flew away at that point. <laughs> now, that's, that's my bird thing. I can't get a blue heron to pose for me. I also can't blow a clematis vine for anything. How many of you have a clematis vine at your house? You know what they are? They're vines, and they grow purple flowers that are about this big around. They're as big as saucers. They're beautiful. I can't tell you how much money I have spent on clematis vines in my gardening heyday. And finally, I had one that started to grow. Well, guess what happened? I hired kids from my youth group to come and clean up my yard and do some mowing for me at the beginning of the season. One of the mothers came along. She was just kind of spying on me, I think, because she went out and decided she was going to weed. She came into the house later when we had lunch and said, there was this god-awful vine. She said, it took me forever, but don't worry. I pulled it off your fence, and I dug up the roots to make sure it wouldn't grow back. And I stood there thinking, I bet the only vine out there was my purple clematis vine. And I looked, and it was gone, along with my stargazer lilies that she decided she was going to get rid of them as well. <sighs> Be careful when you're pulling weeds, because you might pull up something that you don't intend to pull up. Or worse yet, someone might pull something out of your garden that doesn't need to go. Now, how many of you are familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible? Most people, if they know any part of Ecclesiastes, they know the third chapter. For everything, there is a time and a purpose for every matter under heaven. You either know it from hearing it at funerals or from the Pete Seeger song that the birds recorded back in the 60s. 
everything turn, 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 there is a season. Now, if you think about the words that we read today and you think about the passage from the third chapter, you can understand why these are called wisdom writings because they're not stories, they're not narrative stories, but they're the wisdom of God put into succinct passages like the book of Proverbs is another example for people to read and memorize and understand. But what does it mean to cast your bread upon the waters? That seems strange. And it's not feeding ducks in a pond. It's not tossing crumbs out into the water. To cast your bread upon the waters is to send things into the world of value to you so that they might be returned to you. What else does it say? To divide your means seven ways or eight ways, for you do not know disaster may happen on the earth. It means to share freely and fully. When the clouds are full, they empty rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. Whoever observes the wind will not sow, and whoever regards the clouds will not reap. If we try to figure everything out ahead of time, you're probably going to be so completely locked up that you won't be able to do anything. How many times have you looked at the weather on Sunday morning to decide whether we're going to be outside or inside for worship, only to find that whatever they've predicted is not what happens? So God is saying to us, everything is in God's control. We don't know how the breath enters the baby in its mother's womb, but we do know that God makes everything happen in its time. And so we're called to sow regardless of what the outcome might be. We've had a lot of seeds in this passage from Matthew, haven't we? This whole chapter developed, devoted to agricultural sort of parables and parables about the growth of plants and planting. The first we began with was the parable of the sower, right? Go out and sow the seed, throws it, doesn't matter where it lands. He's not furrowing, he's not hoeing, he's not working the soil, he's just randomly scattering seed and letting it grow where it would grow. We talked too about the mustard seed. Even though it's small and insignificant, it can grow and it can house birds in its branches. They can build their nests there because we think something is small and insignificant, but God can use it for great and mighty things. Then we read this one and we don't like it as much, right? Like I said, this is a passage about judgment, isn't it? But I think the way to approach this is not about sitting here going, well, I'm glad that I'm a good piece of wheat here in the pew and we're all here, right? So we must be the good wheat. This is one of those passages talking about those people out there, those nasty, evil people, and they're going to get what's coming to them. Yes, Lord, yes. That's what some people like to read into this. But I would like you to repeat after me a phrase that I hope will stay with you. I hope it will haunt you in some sense. Repeat after me, I am not God's weed whacker. Let's do that again. I am not God's weed whacker. How many of you, now I should have probably said I'm not God's string trimmer because weed whacker is one of those things like a jacuzzi where, or Kleenex where it's a, the name of the brand, right? How many of you have a string trimmer? How many of you whack your weeds that way? What's the danger of whacking weeds with a string trimmer? It's not very discriminant, is it? It'll take out everything in its path, won't it? And it doesn't really dig up anything by the roots, it just sort of knocks everything out so you don't see it at least for a while. The man who mows my yard does some string trimming for me and by, he'll mow for me on Saturday and by Tuesday I have a great crop of dandelions back in my yard again, even more than the week before because they have not been uprooted, they have just been cut off. And don't we tend to go around doing that sometimes with each other? I've told you the story about Aaron who was the custodian in my last congregation who gave up a life of using drugs and selling drugs and gave his life to Jesus Christ. The first Sunday he came to church, he got there late because, you know, if you've been dealing drugs for a living, you probably are not used to getting up at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. But he gets up and he comes to church and he's got a hoodie on with just this little bit of his face showing because he had tattoos that didn't represent who he was anymore. He didn't want people to see them. He was ashamed of them. And he came in and he walked down the side aisle and he came and he sat right in front of me. I could see his face and I could see him listening and receiving grace that he had never received before. After the service, someone said to me, I was ready, Pastor, if he had tried anything. And I said, what do you mean ready? Well, West Virginia is a concealed carry state. And one of my members said he had his gun with him in case this guy tried anything. We tend to try to uproot and weed out people, don't we? 
But what if it's you? Because even the best of wheat sometimes is hard to tell from the weeds, isn't it? Ever had a moment where you looked at yourself in the mirror and you weren't sure what you were looking at or who you were looking at? What if someone saw you at your worst moment and decided whether you were in or out of the church or in or out of the kingdom of God or in or out of God's love and grace? I have been to funerals where it was preached that this person is no longer in God's grace. This person is in hell, and let that be a lesson to the rest of you. I have heard that preached at funerals before. When the summation of someone's life is a cautionary tale to others, And I've had people ask me, why don't you preach against this or that? One time it was good old Dr. Dobson. Some of you have heard of Dr. Dobson. He and I are not exactly in the same theological boat in a lot of cases. And someone said, Dr. Dobson said, if your pastor's not preaching against this, and it was a group of human beings, then your pastor should not be preaching. And this lady said to me, you know, why aren't you preaching against these people? Why aren't you telling us they're going to hell? And I said, because that is above my pay grade. I don't get to decide who goes to hell. Aren't y'all glad about that? Because I can get real ticked off sometimes at people's behavior. My own included. Don't worry. But what if someone saw you before you stopped drinking? Before you got sober? What if someone heard you say the thing that you wish you could take back desperately that you said to someone you love in anger? What if someone heard you gossip or not challenge a racial slur or a bad joke about some other group of human beings? Is that where you would want someone to decide whether you're plucked up or allowed to grow? Repeat after me, I am not God's weed whacker. But we are called to tend our own gardens, aren't we? I've talked about racial issues before here, and I've said if you have racial animus in your heart, if you have prejudice or any sort of feelings or fear about another person because of where they're from or how they look or how they talk or how they act, if you have those things, you've got to root those out by the root. Don't just cut it off at the surface. Root it out through God's help and God's love and God's grace because all of us, all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. And none of us has been called to pass judgment on each other. Now, Jesus says that the day is coming when there is a reckoning. And I do believe that there is a final judgment. And I do believe that God's going to say to me, Terry, you know better. You went to seminary for heaven's sake. What were you thinking when you said this? What were you thinking when you did this? What were you thinking when that thought crossed your mind and you acted on it? I believe that there is a judgment, but this passage gives me hope that in the judgment there is also grace. We hear fire, and what do we think? Hell. If God's going to get those people, that's it. We're in, they're out. End of story. But fire has other purposes in Scripture, not to destroy, but to refine, to cleanse. And maybe all of us will be subjected to a little bit of fire in time so that we might give our best selves to God so that all that is false may be burned away and weeded out of our hearts once and for all. It is a tough passage, isn't it? Because it talks about that future. But who is it that gets to reap the field at the end? Who is it that gets to choose between the wheat and the weeds? Do you remember? The angels. Like I said, way above my pay grade. It's not for us to decide who is righteous. It's not for us to decide who will be in or out of the kingdom. It's up to us to continue to plant seeds, to cast our bread upon the waters, so that we might sow seeds of hope in a hopeless world, so that we might sow seeds of forgiving grace. Do you know how many people there are who would love to be in this building right now, who would love to be in this sanctuary, but who feel like they can't because what they have done has diminished them so much in God's eyes, not to mention our eyes, that they would never dream of setting foot in this place? And do you know how many times someone has come to me and said, can you believe he had the nerve to show his face in this building? If someone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, what better place than to be here? in this garden of wheat and weeds that we are. 
the passage from Ecclesiastes ends with, In the morning sow your seed, and at evening do not let your hands be idle. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. we got to learn to let God decide, don't we? To let God decide. To turn to God in our need and our weediness, to let God help us to figure out what needs to go in our lives, what needs to be trimmed and pruned, and what needs to be allowed to flourish so that everything might give glory to God. I don't know about you, but I am not God's weed whacker. Oh, sometimes I think I am, and sometimes I think I should be, but I am not called to be God's weed whacker. Thanks be to God and Jesus Christ. Amen.